here we are at the home of football, um, Sheffield FC, the world's first, yeah. set where you're currently first team manager, something I'm sure you're extremely proud of and um, just gives an insight on how, how the season's gone so far, how you started. It's gone positive. Um, we managed to get to strengthen the squad in the summer, um, get some good lads in, get um, players that know each other, that have got a bond outside of football um, and that have played at a good level together. We managed to get that in the chairman's back me to do that and the season started off quite well. Um, the performances have been quite well, although we've had a couple of draws that we should have won. And we've had a defeat that we, were, that we were winning in, so overall I'm pleased with the, um, the improvements we've made, so I'm looking forward to, to today and, and moving on. Absolutely. And that's you, this is your next stage in your career, but if we, if we re rewind right back to the start of your career, um, if you think back to your, your pre-twenties when you were a scholar at, at Sheffield United, um, what are the most important things are from that era of your life that shaped you into becoming a professional footballer? Um, and how do you reflect back on your career, which clubs you've been at? I mean, I've probably played at a number of clubs you've played at um, against each other, but there's, there's, a, there's a long time to mould how you become a professional footballer. Just give us a bit of background on that. Well, first and foremost, when I walked out of school gates and then into the United Academy, it was commitment. Um, it was 100% live, breathe, eat, sleep, football. Um, and, it, and at the time, I absolutely loved it. Um, walking to the train station in the morning, getting a train to Sheffield, then walking across the bus station to get a bus up to Shycliffe. It would that were every day. And in the winter, it was tough. Um, so it, it was commitment at the beginning and love of the game and just wanting to be wanting to be the best I could be. Um, but but going back and thinking of the memories, it brings a smile to my face for, well, you didn't have to put some hours in getting up at that time and getting in it. Because people think football lifestyle is it's brilliant and the older you get, all right, maybe. But at the very beginning, it's, it's long days. And something that you've recently been speaking um, really well about and honestly about. Um, so that transition um, from from leaving professional football, um, just tell us a bit more about that. I found it difficult. There's no, there's no hiding behind that fact. Um, at the time I thought that I had it under control and I certainly didn't. I think the, the, the promotions and the, the success are at a cost and the cost for me was that I would put my body through so much I torture, I would put my body through through pain that I was trying to mask and it catches up with you. Uh, for every action there's a there's a reaction and my body just just ended up saying enough's enough. I mean the the list is endless. So the four knee operations, I had two ruptured ankles, two prolapsed discs in my neck, metal plate in my shoulder, umpteen breaks to my nose and it, it takes its toll, you know, when, when, I, when I think about it and I list it and I go, wow, my, <laughs> my medical book must have been, you know, physios must have been, oh no. And, and that's, as again, you mentioned the cost there of what, what professional athletes put themselves through um, for, to, to be successful, to do their job, um, and uh, that can come at a cost. And the, the things you've spoken about when you, you know, introduced to painkillers and, and, and sleeping tablets, I mean, we've all come across and taken paracetamols or we've struggled to sleep after games, it's yeah. quite common. Um, do you remember when you were first introduced to those? Yeah, um, it was probably six months before I left Northampton uh, that I really was taking too many. So to be introduced to them, I had my first knee up the day before my 17th birthday, while I was a scholar. And um, it was a cartilage uh, that needed, they tried to repair it. And to be honest, it lasted nine years. <laughs> um, but then once it, once that went again, um, then I went there. I think, I think the first, first surgery slowed me down. I think, um, I, I honestly think it slowed me down. Yeah, I, thought it, I think it slowed my progress. Um, and then when the second surgery came, it was just a case of why I really need to make sure that I'm on top of this. So I took more and more anti-inflammatories, I took more and more painkillers, so not just paracetamol, I'm talking 
codeine is called codomol tramadol. Um, I mean, at, at one point, not, at one point, I put a morphine patch on me, um, and that just completely numbed. Me. Now, that's not a good feeling to uh, to, to have. It's, it's uh, you don't feel anything. It's scary. And so, you know, you tell us. I mean, when did you realise that there was that that was a problem? Um, and, and how did you see, seek help with that? Um, it were a problem when I. So if I could just give you a, a scenario, do you know when you, you go and have a drink with your friends and you have four or five and you get to that happy state and everything's, you've let shackles off and you can communicate open and freely but it's a laugh and then once you've had enough you go home. Now I got to the stage where I were having painkillers and sleeping tablets and then I want, wanted to have a drink to get that happy state because they, they dampened me then. They, they numbed me from top to bottom, the painkillers and sleeping tablets. So I had a drink to try and get to that happy, like, buzzing place. And I just couldn't get it. It, it, it weren't happening. So I was having more and more and more. And then the drink would just, it ended up knocking me out. Um, and then it become a, a, an issue where I needed it. My body were craving it. And then when it went inside me, it was, <sighs> so that was the normal feeling. And that became the normal feeling. Um, which is insane. It's, it's not. That's not normal feelings. Uh, this is normal. Me being able to speak to you open and freely about it, um, and not masking that I've took eight or nine tablets today, a mixture of things, and then swilling them down with with drink. It's not. It's not normal. And, and was there was there a was there a point? Can you remember that vividly or not? Where you thought I need to ch I need help here? Yeah. And how and how did you go about seeking that help? Um, we just finished training at Eastley and Hess, the manager, Andy Hess and Tyler. Yeah. Uh, I walked into his office straight after training and I sat down and I said, I need to speak to you, Gaffer. He went, what's up, Chris? I, went, I just, just flooded out. I just told him. And he went, I knew it. I knew it. I'm sorry. And he, and he was so like, to have someone that understood, sat across from me, who spotted it, but were waiting for me to acknowledge it, I think that's the sign of someone that uh, he had his eye on me and waited for me to, to go and see him. And um, I've got massive respect for him for that. And he, he did everything in his power to help. He got in contact with the PFA, he got in contact with the Spot and Chance. And he just and he asked me if it would help if I went back home. And I just said, yeah, please. And I, and I went back home and, and told my family that what I told the manager, and they knew as well, but that was the first time I opened up to them. So roughly, Around about thirty year old, and I know we, we've spoken um, quite regular. But like, how how are you now? Um, and and what role did the PFA play throughout your recovery? Well, I think they played a part in in all of it. I mean, I I'm not scared to say that I contacted you when I were in a really bad place. I mean, you you helped me on the phone when I didn't make sense myself, and, and I thank you for that. And, and it's. It, uh, it like it hurts me because I didn't ever expect to need to do that and you answered the phone and you contacted me the day after and you made sure that I was safe, just be safe today, just don't do anything else. No? And then words off someone, off a fellow professional that I respected in the game, who I thought were head and shoulders above, above me. And you come and speak to me and say that you enjoyed playing against each other and it's that makes me think, well, you must kind of think that I have a kind of like, and it, self perception, really. I, I didn't perceive myself to be that good. But. We, 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 you, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's an empathy from, that we all have, like a yeah. brotherhood of professionals. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's an empathy that any of us could possibly be in the situation at any time, um, regardless of what divisions we've ever played in, what teams we've ever played in. Um, they used to be, you know, coming together, let's say, at the PFA Awards, yeah. and you, it was a, it was a time of, of, of reflection. At the end of the season, you could have had a good season, an average season, or, or a relegation season. Um, but you have that bond, um, and you will come across players now. Um, you might be signing players who, who are PFA members. Yeah. You might come across managers now that you've played against, and there's so many, so much empathy and, and uh, that you can talk to each other on, I suppose, a professional level. Um, which 
which which is a bond which you probably we don't realise is there until yeah, we have that chat. Absolutely. Um, and so, with, with everything you have experienced, what would be a, your advice be to players who are currently using various painkillers? Um, part of the or part of the challenges that players don't admit to themselves or, or realise that they have a problem. What would your advice be to the players? You know if you're taking too many. So my advice to the player would be speak to someone within the club, speak to the PFA, phone me. I mean, my phones, people can get in contact. You can get in contact with anyone you want these days. So reach out to someone, um, as people have already reached out to me and dropped me private messages and, and I've phoned, like you said, the Brotherhood. I've phoned players and, and I'd, I'd lend the chats with them about what I think they should do next. So I think that they should pick the phone up and contact a helpline number, contact a player, a family member, the manager, because as a player, you think if you tell your manager, then he's not going to play you. Or you tell your manager and it's going to affect your career. Now we need to make sure that these players know that it's not going to affect the career, because by them being a better person, more in control of what they're taking and putting in the system, creates them to be a better player, short term as well as long term. So pick the phone up and, and, and please do tell someone that you're taking too many and don't be ashamed of it. I mean, it can be kept private, you don't have to go public about it, but I've lost a couple of teammates in recent years that I didn't know were suffering. And that's the reason I'm having this conversation with you because it hurts me to see that they have families and they didn't they didn't say anything. And it's that's not we are a brotherhood, regardless of whether you knew him or you didn't know him, or it's an ex-teammate or it's uh, someone who you played against. I want to help that person. And so on to um, you mentioned tramadol before. Um, so WADA, the World Sport and World Anti-Doping Authority, have announced that tramadol is going to be added to the list of banned substances. Um, again, a fellow PFA member, Chris Kirkland, has, has recently opened, opened up about his problems with, with tramadol. It's a powerful opiate painkiller um, that we know is used in football. And so what would your advice be to a player who might be using tramadol and is worried about their needing to stop? It's, it's, a, it's a process. You can't just stop. You have to have seek professional advice. Um, so my, <laughs> I would say go and get professional advice because that is a serious, uh, serious drug. For what? I mean, the word drug and sports just don't go together. So to speak, we can speak about it because it's not going to affect me. It's not going to affect you, but is it going to affect the player that's at a football club who's under contract? Yeah, so we don't want to talk about it, but I would say to that player, seek medical advice. Phone Chris, phone me, phone, just just know that someone, whatever you're going through, someone has already been through it and come through it. So seek advice from that person, it's not, it don't make you weak, it don't make you soft, it don't stop people thinking any worse of you. Making, do you know what I'm saying? It don't, it don't change that, that, that process. Um, but I've spoke to Chris at length and I've had a really good chat with him about what he was doing, what I was doing and the similarities are crazy and I'm talking about an, an ex-England international and an ex-Rodham player <laughs> it's, we did the same thing to get to the same to make sure that we were prepared and we were alright for the next game it don't matter what level you're at it don't matter if you're Sunday league level it don't matter if you're a professional at an elite level it causes the same problems and we have to deal with them problems by speaking to people that, that know what they're doing. Well, I must say, I mean, from everybody at the PFA, thank you for giving me time today, chatting to others the way you have, everything you've already done uh, publicly, um, and you know, continue you know, what you're doing, we wish you the best of luck. We are at the world's first at Sheffield FC yep. um, in your game today, so thank you very much. Great to see you. Man. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.